This is Greg Troutwine with Marine Technology TV, and we're very pleased to be joined today by Rick Spinrad, the Undersecretary of Commerce for Oceans and Atmosphere, NOAA Administrator, for a discussion on the National Ocean and Atmospheric Administration's priorities in the coming years. Rick, you certainly need no introduction to this audience, to put start, but to start, why don't you give us an overview of uh, NOAA today, a by the numbers look at the using the metrics of your choice. Thank you, Greg, and I really appreciate the opportunity to talk with Marine Technology Reporter. Uh, it's a real treat for me to engage with a community that already has some familiarity with what we do. By the numbers, you know, I've got to start with the workforce. We've got 12,000 passionate uh, career professionals scattered all around the world working on this extraordinary diversity of activities. You know that we map and chart the US uh, EEC, uh, we've got, <clears throat> excuse me, over a thousand uh, maps and charts out there. We have responsibility for 95,000 miles of coastline or three, almost three and a half million square miles of EEZ. Last year, for example, 2019 actually, because 2020 we had COVID impact on our fleet. But last year our ships cruised for more than a quarter million miles conducting hydrographic survey, fishery survey research. We protect uh, species. We have responsibility for 164 uh, endangered or threatened species. We have recovered 47 uh, fish stocks uh, in the last decade or so. We protect more than 600,000 square miles of what we could call underwater parks. Our marine debris program has pulled out 22,000 tons of debris since 2006. And that's all just the ocean side. And then of course, when you look at our responsibilities and weather, every year we're putting out, we're getting about six and a half billion weather observations and putting out well over a million forecasts to the American public writ large. So, you know, there's just a quick shot. And, and I should point out, we also engage students. So we've engaged almost a half a million uh, K through 12 students in our various educational programs. So. Really, by any metric, uh, we are literally all over the map, fully engaged with an extraordinarily diverse portfolio. So using the start of your career to today as bookends, can you put in perspective how the focus on ocean issues has changed the most? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, and I would point out my career of, gosh, it's over 40 years now, if you go back to my uh, uh, undergraduate days. but. I think about it in the sense that ocean science uh, back when I was an undergrad was really oriented towards getting uh, measurements to the best of our abilities. And it was extraordinarily difficult to get measurements. We didn't have satellites. Going to sea took a lot of effort. The, the dollars per bit of data was probably extraordinarily high. And it was really around pretty fundamental applications. Can we uh, help the shipping industry get a better handle on surface currents? Can we help the fishing industry uh, have a safer working environment? And what's changed, in my opinion, is that we're doing a much better job. We've got much more robust observations. We have an integrated ocean observing system, which we didn't have before. We have more diverse and better data and information to support a much broader set of needs. So now, we're integrally connected with public safety, with marine resource management. And so I think the observational capabilities through things like IUs is fundamentally different. And then we also have enhanced computational capabilities so we can make forecasts better than we could before. And here's another real kicker I never would have imagined back when I started in this. Now we're starting to see this fully coupled integration of ocean science and business. And, in fact, some universities now have started what they call blue MBA programs where students can go in and get a master's or PhD in some aspect of ocean science and also a business degree. And that's one of the things we're seeing. It's part of what I call the new blue economy, taking advantage of these observations of these predictive capabilities to build out a new economic sector. The, you know, the other thing I've got to say, and, and I'll, I'll probably have a little bit more to say about this is, the technology changes that we've seen, certainly the um, explosive nature of autonomous uncrewed systems to collect uh, this incredible array of environmental data. When you take that, when you take our satellites and other observing systems and, and uh, 
some of the really incredible emerging platforms that we've got. We can now do things we never could have imagined. We can forecast rip currents up to six days in advance. And, and if you look at some of the new technologies like eDNA, imagine now we can just take a few drops of water and we can know what species are present in that water. So the applications to fisheries management or things like detecting and predicting harmful algal blooms has just made our ocean technology and ocean science area so much more relevant, so much more valuable to lives, livelihood, and quality of life writ large. Rick, in your biography online, it says your responsibilities include, and I quote, developing NOAA's portfolio of products and services to address climate crisis, enhancing environmental sustainability, and fostering economic development. Can you give us a brief overview of NOAA's portfolio of products and services today, and more importantly, your priorities to enhance this portfolio in the coming 12 to 24 months? So I'll, I'll start with the latter part. One of my main priorities is to establish NOAA uh, as the authoritative source for products and services. What I often call mission agnostic products and services, and what I mean by that is that that particular product, whether it's a forecast of sea surface temperature or a forecast of expected drought or flood conditions, may be just as relevant for fisheries as it is for agriculture, as it is for energy, as it is for transportation. NOAA, just as we do for weather with the National Weather Service, uh, really is well positioned to become that uh, national authoritative source for climate products and services. And it means having uh, readily available, easily accessible, reliable, accurate information about climate. And climate products and services means everything from sea level rise to ice to temperatures to uh, precipitation to extreme storms. You know, just recently, uh, we played a role at NOAA in co authoring uh, the climate, uh, the Chicago Regional Climate Action Plan that was intended to guide the Chicago area's. Uh, climate mitigation and adaptation uh, planning activities. We also produce drought forecasts to inform farmers. I just moved back to DC from the high desert of Oregon, and I can guarantee you that the National Integrated Drought Information System, NIDAS, a NOAA product in conjunction with our other agency partners, has been extremely valuable in seasonal predictions and projections about how should we prepare for drought and for fire season as well. You can imagine our sea level rise viewer is going to enable coaster planners like the ones on the South uh, Long Island shore to understand and build resilience against the risk that they're going to face from rising seas and from the increased frequency and intensity of coastal storms that are coming in as well. And, you know, it's one thing to produce the products. It's another thing to make sure, first of all, that you're producing the products that are needed. And second of all, that you're actually getting those products into the hands of the users. We are putting a very strong overlay of equity in our development of products and services. We want to make sure that we are addressing the needs of the most vulnerable communities uh, throughout the country. And we have the tools to do that. In fact, in our fiscal year 22 budget, we're looking to uh, expand some of these programs like our RESAs, the Regional Integrated Sciences and Assessments Program. And of course, of course the National Sea Grant College Program which works with coastal communities. So you take those tools for outreach and engagement, you take the scientific and technological tools for improved products and services, and then you put the overlay, the equity lens, if you will, on that. And I think we're very well positioned to address uh, the needs. One other thing I really wanna comment on that that is new that we're undertaking is a series of climate, a climate and equity roundtables. So, both regionally and sectorally, we're looking to answer the questions of what do people in the Gulf Coast need? What do people in the Northeast need? The Pacific Northwest, Alaska, the Pacific Islands. Um, and how can we address, again, uh, with that equity lens, the needs of some of the most vulnerable communities? Because what works for the Mississippi River Basin is not the same answer for what works in, in drought-influenced Northern California, for example. So listening sessions, roundtables are part of what we're doing to serve those communities, many of which have traditionally been underserved 
and are already facing some of these devastating climate impacts. Uh, obviously, you've had a very long and distinguished career. And when you look at the cadre of new and emerging technologies today at your disposal to study and better understand the oceans, which technologies do you believe will have the greatest impact in the coming decade to efficiently, effectively, and safely study and why? So I think uh, without a doubt, one of the most uh, dramatic changes in technology that we are exploiting right now in the ocean world is associated with autonomous or uncrewed systems as they're called, uh, both underwater, aerial, surface. These technologies have emerged uh, over the last 10 years or so. Uh, I think we first started to see some uh, examples in underwater gliders. Uh, and in fact, I remember about 10 years ago being involved in a program to demonstrate the ability to transit the Atlantic with a glider, uh, a program that Rutgers University pioneered and demonstrated very effectively. Um, that ability allows us now to have a persistent presence in the ocean. It also gives us a capability for, if you will, adaptive sampling. No longer are we constrained to have the ship running at eight to 10 knots doing a lawnmower pattern in the ocean, only to find that we've missed a particular feature because we couldn't adaptively sample and we weren't there. Uncrewed systems allowed, uh, allow us to do that. I would also point out uh, these underwater gliders right now are demonstrating an extraordinary capability for acquiring data to improve our forecasts of hurricanes, hurricane intensity, uh, to some extent track, but the ability to have a picket line of these as the hurricane is coming through is, is dramatically improving the quality uh, and the accuracy of uh, hurricane forecasts. If you, if you look at what we're doing with surface vehicles, we're now realizing we might be able to complement the traditional approaches to fishery stock assessments using acoustic uh, uh, sensors uh, put on these uh, surface vehicles. In the air, uncrewed aerial systems, can collect high resolution uh, imagery. Uh, they can even collect DNA from the breath of a whale to give us uh, some sense of the health of that particular animal. So in, in any part of the environment, above the water, on the surface, underneath the surface, these uncrewed systems are true, truly proving to be a force multiplier and a disruptive technology in terms of our being able to do amazing things. Um, I'm just going to stick on that uncrewed maritime systems thread for a moment. Um, in one of my recent interviews with uh, Bob Ballard, uh, you know, one of my favorite quotes was, I, and he was talking about uh, autonomous systems in the future of it. He said, I like riding horses, but I don't ride one to work. Uh, <laughs> so, so when you look um, at uncrewed maritime systems, how are they deployed today? And I guess more importantly, how do you see UMS expanding in the near and the long term? So uncrewed systems are being used for an extraordinary array of applications. I mentioned the application of complementing our stock assessments, but uh, the idea of uh, uncrewed systems initially being uh, developed to address the three Ds, dull, dirty, and dangerous. Uh, I would add, uh, now we include the additional D of difficult. So it's difficult to conduct missions in the high Arctic in certain times of the year or in the Southern Ocean. And we now know that we can use uncrewed surface vehicles to do exactly that. So we can, we can do the sort of dull work, we can do the dangerous work, we can do the dirty work, transiting oil spills, for example. And we can also do the difficult missions that these are associated with. So if you think about all of the potential applications associated with fisheries, with general oceanography, with uh, endangered species, with marine debris, all of these missions can be uh, complemented, if not completely addressed through the use of uncrewed systems. And as I said a little earlier, the, this concept of adaptive sampling so that you can target a particular feature and actually get there to make those observations uh, is a new aspect. What I think we're gonna see in the future is some dramatic enhancements and increases of using these uh, platforms for things like mapping. You know, it's 
that's a tough challenge with, with all of the three and a half million square miles we've got just in the US EEZ and our commitment under, under Seabed 2030 to completely map and chart our EEZ by the year 2030. We are gonna have to do that uh, with the traditional approaches, but also with the exploitation of uncrewed systems. Uh, we're also going to see uncrewed systems used as data relays, I think much more aggressively than we have in the past. In fact, I remember years ago talking about whether we could start getting rid of the open ocean buoys that we have relied on for years and years as data receivers and transmitters. Um, you know, an open ocean buoy is an expensive, difficult thing to deploy and maintain. Perhaps you don't need to have that catenary mooring going 4,000 meters down, perhaps you could actually use a surface vehicle that is station keeping to acquire the data, transmit it, and also receive instructions for tasking what could be, and this is the final thought, resident systems that sit in parts of the ocean waiting to be tasked and deployed to conduct particular missions. I also believe, final thought, that we are gonna see an explosion of the use of swarmed uncrewed uh, vessels, uncrewed systems that are actually using artificial intelligence uh, applications to determine how to deploy, how to swarm, where to go, when to sample, how to sample, uh, when to send uh, data back, when to ask for new instructions. So I'm really excited about the potential application of AI ML uh, to the use of uncrewed systems and the potential for downstream resident systems of uncrewed underwater vehicles ready to respond to the needs at a moment's notice. I know you touched on it earlier, but when you look at the full scope of your responsibilities under your command, can you distill for me your top priorities in the coming 12 to 24 months? Briefly stated, the priorities I've expressed fall into three categories, uh, and, and they are not unique to a particular line office. So I'm not here to say, this is what I want the weather service to do, or the Ocean Service or NESDIS or fisheries. But instead, uh, I really believe NOAA is positioned to be seen as the authoritative source for climate information products and services. That's priority one. Demonstrate that. Uh, don't simply say we think we ought to have it, but through our actions, through our programs, through our engagement, through our solicitation of requirements, demonstrate that we are the authoritative source of climate products and services. The second element is integrating uh, equity into our uh, internal and external operations. Uh, equity in terms of ensuring that our products and services are provided uh, to those, uh, all communities, uh, but a special focus on those most vulnerable communities. Internally, we need to take a, a big leap in diversifying the workforce at NOAA, so we're undertaking a number of workforce development activities to make sure we are representative of the public whom we serve. And the third priority, which I think will really resonate with a lot of your uh, audience and readership is advancing what I call the new blue economy. That is to say the economy that's based on data, information and knowledge about the ocean, supporting some aspects of the traditional blue economy, but also supporting uh, other emerging sectors like public health, for example, and the reinsurance and insurance industries. So we can make possible this new blue economy because of the advances we've made in ocean observations and ocean prediction. So those are the three, some of the folks on my staff call those uh, the three E's, uh, the environment, equity, and the economy. Call them what you want. Those are the things that we're gonna be pushing for in the next years to come. Uh, we've already touched on many of the technology uh, points, but in your career to date, what do you count as the number one technology evolution that has helped oceanographers to do their business more safely and efficiently? Yeah, Greg, you know, I, I would have to say coarsely defined. I think the one technology or advancement has been miniaturization uh, because it has been a game changer. Uh, in terms of uh, platforms, for example, uh, I worked for Navy for many years in my career, and I remember one of the original autonomous underwater vehicles that Navy operated was powered with somewhere between five and 10,000 D cells. Um, it had a lot of functions to do, but miniaturization 
of the platform now, if you look at all of the um, commercial developers of uncrewed underwater vehicles, they're remarkably small, nimble, and powerful. Look at the sensors, what we've done. Um, early in my career, I was the president of SeaTech Incorporated. We developed the fluorometer. The original fluorometers were about the size of a 30 gallon garbage can. And now they're more the size of a, of a D cell battery, in fact, that you can put onto a, onto a, a CTD. Look at what we've done with dissolved oxygen sensors. Look at eDNA, for crying out loud, we can do virtually real-time analyses of the DNA content in the ocean. Using a relatively small sensor package that sits on an underwater or, or an uncrewed underwater vehicle. And then onboard processing is the last part of that. Uh, the ability to power, uh, collect data, transmit data can be done in, with a lot less real estate. So I think, all of that has contributed, first of all, to the ability for a much larger community to engage. You don't necessarily need a 300 foot research vessel in order to deploy these sophisticated instruments. It's also begged the, the uh, capability, pushed the envelope in terms of endurance and the diversity of sensors that we can uh, exploit on all of these various platforms. So miniaturization has been a key technology that's changed our game, I believe. If you had the best advice for young people thinking of pursuing a career in oceanography, what would that advice be? Mm. Well, the first bit of advice I have is go to sea. Um, it's, I worked for an admiral once who said, let's make sure we don't all turn into cubicle scientists or cubicle technologists. You do need the experience. You do need to understand the environment. You actually need to understand how difficult it is to collect information um, about the ocean. And so I would say go to sea, whether it's going out on a two-week cruise with your, your academic institution or uh, participating uh, in some experiments with uh, uh, non-governmental organizations uh, or even doing one of the seagoing camps or summers at sea, that kind of thing. Go to sea. The second thing I'd say is get out of your comfort zone. Um, I would suggest if you're oriented toward physics, for example, study a little biology. If you're a biologist, study economics. Take some coursework out of your straight line trajectory in a particular field. You will find that because Earth systems are inherently transdisciplinary, it'll pay off enormously if you have some diversity in your educational experience. Now, the last thing I'd say, a lot of people say, well, get a good mentor. I actually think the message is find three mentors because you're going to find that uh, the lens that each mentor looks through in terms of their experiences, their advice, uh, each one is going to be fundamentally different. And if you can find, it doesn't have to be three, but two or three or four people whom you respect, people who will take some time to work with you, advise you, guide you over a relatively long period of time, you will find a real richness in that experience. So go to sea, get outside your comfort zone and find three mentors would be the advice I'd give young people. Every leadership position has its challenges. What do you consider to be your biggest challenge and how do you address it? I think the biggest challenge as a leader is finding that right balance of staying diverse while staying focused. Uh, you have, especially as NOAA administrator, one minute you're dealing with a fisheries regulatory issue, the next minute you're dealing with uh, satellite uh, budgeting and schedules, the next minute, uh, you're dealing with a weather forecast uh, improvement program. It's real easy to say, I want to do a deep dive in this. Uh, you can't afford to do that. You have to stay diverse while staying focused, but you also can't become disenfranchised. Um, so stay away from, staying away from the weeds while staying adequately engaged and aware at the, at the most critical level, and also taking best advantage of the team that you've got. I'm fortunate. The NOAA workforce is one of the most passionate, uh, smartest, most engaged workforces I've ever known. And I think uh, in my leadership position, the best thing I can do is challenge them and take advantage of them to the best of my abilities. Rick, as always, spectacular. I truly look forward to working with you and your team in the coming years. Thank you, Greg. It's been a pleasure and I look forward to working with you as well.